This is why the Book of Enoch got banned. The Book of Enoch is one of several pseudopiographical, falsely ascribed works, books whose claimed authorship is unsubstantiated, publications that claim to be written by Enoch. In verses 14 and 15, the biblical book of Jude includes a quotation from the book of Enoch. This prophecy originates from the book of First Enoch. The fact that he is quoting authoritatively from a work that is not considered to be part of the canon brings up some apparent issues. Jude 14 through 15. It was also about these people that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord has come with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. It is important to note that quoting from the book of Enoch in the Bible does not necessarily mean that the book of Enoch is of divine origin or should be considered part of the Bible. This is similar to other instances in the Bible where quotes are borrowed from sources outside of the Bible. For example, Jude's quote from the book of Enoch is just one example. Another example is when the Apostle Paul mentions the works of Epimenides in Titus chapter 1 verse 12. However, these references do not imply that the non-biblical writings should be given the same authority as the Bible. Similarly, even though Jude quotes from the book of Enoch in verses 14 and 15, it does not mean that all quotations from the book of Enoch are inspired or authentic. Rather, it simply suggests that the specific verses in question are accurate. It's important to treat the Book of Enoch and other similar works the same way we approach other texts considered to be apocryphal. If you choose to read these books, remember, they are not the authorized Word of God, which is divinely inspired and written by God Himself. No other book besides the Bible can claim to be the divinely inspired and authoritative Word of God. There are four different men in the Bible named Enoch. However, it should be noted that only the NIV gives the name Hanok, while other translations use the name Enoch. Hanok in Hebrew translates to Enoch. Genesis chapter 4 verse 17, Genesis chapter 5 verse 18. Some translations use a different spelling such as Hankoch or Hanok. The first Enoch was the child of Cain. Genesis chapter 4 verse 17. Cain had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Cain built the city and named the city Enoch after the name of his son. The second Enoch was the son of Jared. Genesis chapter 5 verse 18. Now Jared lived 162 years and fathered Enoch. The third Enoch was the son of Midian. Genesis chapter 25 verse 4. The sons of Midian were Epah, Epher, Hanak, Abida, and Eldah. All of these were the sons of Keturah. The fourth Enoch was the son of Reuben. Genesis chapter 46, verse 9. And the sons of Reuben, Hanuk, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. God is able to demonstrate his enormous power through us in stunning ways. However, the question we all need to answer is, am I truly loyal and committed to God the way he is committed to me? The Bible portrays people whose responses to God's love for them were filled with heartfelt thanks, unwavering devotion, and intense zeal. Because of this, there were many wonderful displays of his enormous might through them. Enoch. In the kingdom, we grow by seeking direct encounters with God through his word and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Another way we grow is by carefully following and learning from those who have gone ahead of us, whether historically or currently alive. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. So that you will not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and endurance inherit the promises. This suggests that one way we can strive towards understanding God and spiritually developing is to find role models and examples who have been able to capture deep aspects of God through their lives and study their journey. This is a way for us to grow spiritually. Genesis chapter 5 verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch mentioned in the Bible in Genesis chapters 5, 22, and 24 was the father of Methuselah, who was the oldest living man as recorded in Scripture. According to Jude, Enoch prophesied about God's wrath against the widespread moral corruption during the days of Noah. This prophecy, however, is not included in the Bible. 
Enoch is described as a man who walked with God, and his story stands out among his contemporaries who were primarily known for their family lineage. Despite not living as long as some others, his testimony is remarkable. According to the Bible, Enoch had a close relationship with God. When it was time for him to leave this world, God took him away without the usual process of dying. His explanation is brief but carries a lot of weight and significance. This indicates that his relationship with God was completely pure. Throughout different generations, Enoch's life has served as a model for many people, teaching us to live for an audience of one. He imparts this knowledge to us subtly, understanding that if we seek a deep and genuine connection and fellowship with God with all our hearts, we will encounter God in a refreshing way as a result of our efforts. Genesis chapter 5 verses 18 through 24. Now Jared lived 162 years and fathered Enoch. Then Jared lived 800 years after he fathered Enoch, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Now Enoch lived 65 years and fathered Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he fathered Methuselah, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The Enoch incident was the first documented rapture, as God simply took him. It's possible that Enoch reached such a high level of fellowship with the presence of God, engulfed him, and carried him away. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 through 6. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For before he was taken up, he was attested to have been pleasing to God. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For the one who comes to God must believe that he exists, and that he proves to be one who rewards those who seek him. Those who invest a lot expect a lot in return. But if we disregard their power, it won't be long before we become so restricted that weakness pervades every aspect of our lives. It is a great comfort to know that God will always prepare adequately and abundantly for his own, and that he will tenderly watch over us till we blossom in every miraculous way. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth, so that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on you will have wars. Regardless of how generously the Father blesses us to help us grow, all he really wants from us is a genuine and heartfelt response to the love he gives us. John chapter 4, verses 23 through 24. But a time is coming, and even now has arrived, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is always searching for seeds of faith and loyalty, people who will wholeheartedly and sincerely dedicate their lives to him. These are the vessels through which God can legitimately display his glory. Enoch had a close relationship with God. The Bible clearly states that despite living a normal human life, Enoch had a deep relationship with God. This is something we should also keep in mind. In Enoch's story, we can see parallels with the story of revelation that is yet to come. In a wicked world, we are called to be righteous and to walk in faith with God. While we do not know the exact time Jesus will return, it is likely that many, if not all of us, will experience the pangs of death. Christians in the end times will experience a rapture. It is important to note that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, Christians who have died in the past and Christians who are still alive will participate in this event together. This is something that the Bible says will happen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep. Now just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. Subscribe and also click that notification bell so you won't miss any of the next videos that are uploaded every day. All right, let's keep rolling. So that you will not grieve as indeed the rest of mankind do who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, so also God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. 
For we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In either case, we will experience the rapture. During that time, like Enoch, Christians will be caught up in the air. It's also possible to see God being able to speak through non-biblical sources, assuming that the book of Enoch is a pseudopiographical work. It's important for us to use our judgment to distinguish between what is true and what is not true, just as the apostles drew inspiration from non-religious thinkers and poets. We too can find divine inspiration in other works of literature. He remained steadfast in speaking the truth and maintaining a strong connection with God. Enoch, along with other Old Testament heroes mentioned in the Faith Hall of Fame, lived in faith and hope of a future Messiah. This Messiah has been revealed to us in the Gospels as Jesus Christ. Enoch demonstrated faithfulness to God, truthfulness and obedience by following his example. Walking with God and trusting in Christ as Savior, we can experience physical death, but we will be resurrected to eternal life. Elijah had a similar experience to Enoch in that he was taken up to heaven at once. At that time, Israel had fallen into apostasy, and as a result, fewer people were worshiping God. A large number of people were following their idols or their own desires. However, Elijah stepped in and single-handedly defended God's name while the children of Israel had abandoned. It is important to remember that God had promised to do things that are beyond human comprehension for those who love him. In the cases of Enoch and Elijah, he was simply keeping his word. Given our understanding of God's faithfulness to his word, let's make seeking him and his kingdom our top priority. By doing so, he will empower us to serve as vessels that bring glory to him. What story does the book of Enoch contain? The Fallen Watchers. The Book of Enoch provides detailed accounts of heavenly beings known as Watcher Angels or simply Watchers. Watcher Angels are mentioned in the Bible, specifically in the Book of Daniel, where King Nebuchadnezzar has visions involving these celestial beings. I was looking in the visions in my mind and I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. Daniel chapter 4 verse 13. These watchers are heavenly beings with the authority to speak for God. They are depicted as wakeful ones, which means they are always alert and vigilant, watching over human affairs. The Nephilim The Nephilim, also known as giants, are some of the most puzzling characters found in the Bible and the Book of Enoch. People have spent a lot of time trying to understand where they come from, what they are like, and why they are important. The word Nephilim is found in the Bible in two places, Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 and Numbers chapter 13 verse 33. Both of these mentions make them seem mysterious and scary. There were Nephilim, men of stature, notorious men on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God lived with the daughters of men, and they gave birth to their children. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, great reputation, fame. Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Their presence on earth exacerbated moral decay and social problems caused by the Watchers, leading to a time of increased violence and wrongdoing. The widespread violence and corruption brought up by the Nephilim necessitated a divine intervention to restore order and righteousness. The Great Flood was God's response to this corruption, an act of judgment meant to cleanse the earth and reestablish His divine order. The narrative of the Nephilim and their destruction in the flood is not only a story of judgment, but also one of divine mercy and restoration. Noah and his family were spared from the floodwaters because of their righteousness, symbolizing the preservation of a faithful remnant amidst widespread wickedness. The Bible gives us hints at a world that had deviated far from what God intended. So, as Noah builds his ark, a massive vessel, about 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. It appears that the fallen angels committed their sin again after the flood. However, 
it is likely that it occurred to a much lesser extent than before the flood. We go to Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. Here we meet a new set of characters, Moses, the Israelite spies, and the inhabitants of Canaan, including the descendants of Anak, who are linked to the Nephilim. Who exactly were these descendants of Anak? The Bible introduces them during the story of Moses sending 12 spies to explore the land of Canaan. The spies come back with a startling report. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. The verse suggests that the descendants of Anak were related to the Nephilim, known for their great size and strength. Moses, leading the Israelites out of Egypt, sends spies to scout the Promised Land. The spies come back terrified, saying, Hold on, didn't we just say the Nephilim were wiped out in the flood? How did they survive the flood? But here's the big question. If the Nephilim were around before the great flood, and the flood wiped out all but Noah and his family, how could the descendants of Anak, which are linked to the Nephilim, be around after the flood? When we consider the flood, we read, He blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the ground. Genesis chapter 7, verse 23. This verse makes it clear that the flood was incredibly comprehensive in its destruction. So, how could the Nephilim have survived such an event? There are different opinions to this. Some suggest that the Nephilim mentioned afterward in Genesis were a new group, unrelated to those before the flood. Others propose that the term Nephilim might not refer to a specific lineage, but rather a title or description given to giants or mighty warriors across different eras. It's also possible that after the flood, the demons mated with human females again, resulting in more Nephilim. It's even possible that some Nephilim characteristics were passed down through the lineage of one of Noah's daughters-in-law. The Book of Enoch in the Ethiopian Bible the Ethiopian Bible is fascinating due to its unique content and rich history. Unlike other biblical canons, the Ethiopian Bible contains 88 books, some of which are not found in other churches. These include the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, and various other texts. This version of the Bible includes ancient scrolls from both the Old and New Testaments, some of which have never been seen elsewhere. One intriguing aspect is that Ethiopia has been a Christian nation since the 4th century, long before Christianity spread to many other parts of the world. Historical records show that Ethiopia welcomed Christian refugees, fleeing persecution from other kingdoms and empires. This historical embrace of Christianity demonstrates the deep roots of the faith in Ethiopian culture. In the 5th century, the Bible was translated into Ge'ez, the ancient liturgical language of Ethiopia. This was a significant milestone as it made the scriptures accessible to the Ethiopian people in their own language. This allowed the faithful to directly engage with the Word of God, encouraging a deep-rooted and vibrant Christian culture. The Unique Place of the Ethiopian Bible in Christian Tradition The Ethiopian Bible has a unique history and structure that distinguishes it within Christian tradition. It contains texts that are not found in other Christian Bibles, which are preserved and recognized by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. This rich manuscript tradition demonstrates Ethiopia's early and lasting influence in the Christian world. Why was the Ethiopian Bible banned? The Bible as we know it today was formed through a complex process that involved making decisions about which texts to include. Early church leaders convened at councils, such as the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD and the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD to establish the official Bible. They determined that a book would be considered scripture if it was written by one of Jesus' followers or by someone who witnessed his teachings, and if it aligned with the rest of the Bible. As a result, many texts were excluded. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In the early 1600s, King James I commissioned a significant revision of the Bible to settle religious differences and strengthen his authority. This led to the creation of the King James Bible which became widely accessible due to advancements in printing. However, 
It's important to note that the King James Bible, like earlier versions such as the Vulgate, excluded some books that were included in the Ethiopian Bible. The Ethiopian Bible is not well known partly because it is written in Ge'ez, an ancient Ethiopian language, making it inaccessible to non-speakers. The lack of translations has further limited its reach. Additionally, the unique practices and traditions of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church have contributed to its relative isolation from other Christian denominations. Content of the Ethiopian Bible Books of Enoch The Ethiopian Bible also contains Jubilees The Book of Jubilees, also known as Little Genesis, is a retelling of the Book of Genesis with additional details and interpretations. It provides a more detailed account of the creation story, the lives of the patriarchs, and the establishment of Jewish laws and customs. The book discusses the importance of respecting the Sabbath day and introduces a calendar based on the sun, unlike the traditional moon-based Jewish calendar. It divides time into jubilees, which are groups of 49 years, and attempts to synchronize Bible stories with its own timeline. Book of Maccabean the Book of Maccabean is a unique text found in the Ethiopian Bible. Unlike the Maccabees found in Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, the Book of Maccabean provides distinct historical and theological narratives. These books highlight the struggles and triumphs of the Jewish people, offering valuable lessons and reflections on faith and perseverance. This collection consists of three books, focusing on the challenges faced by the Israelites under foreign domination. The books emphasize the importance of upholding the law and the power of divine intervention. Protagonists in these narratives, though lesser known, embody resilience and unwavering faith despite suffering. Why these books matter and what they mean for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today eager to understand the depths of your divine mysteries. As we embark on this journey to explore the book of Enoch, we seek your wisdom and guidance. Lord, you are the source of all knowledge and understanding, and we humbly ask that you brighten our hearts and minds as we delve into this ancient text. Father, we acknowledge the curiosity that stirs within us about the fallen watchers and the Nephilim, mysterious beings mentioned both in your holy scriptures and the book of Enoch. We are drawn to these stories, seeking to understand their significance and the lessons they may hold for us. Yet, we approach this text with caution, knowing that it is not part of the Bible. We ask for your discernment, that we may rightly divide the truth and gain insights that draw us closer to you. Guide us through the ancient texts, ensuring that our fascination does not lead us astray. May our exploration deepen our faith and understanding of your divine plan. Grant us the wisdom to discern the historical and spiritual truths embedded within these stories, helping us to see your hand at work in all things. Lord, as we read about the Watchers, those angels who fell from grace, we are reminded of the importance of obedience and humility before you. The story of their rebellion serves as a warning against the dangers of pride and disobedience. Help us, O oh God, to learn from their mistakes. Grant us the humility to submit to your will and the strength to resist temptations that lead us away from your path. We also reflect on the existence of the Nephilim, the offspring of these watchers and human women. Their presence brought great corruption and violence to the earth ultimately leading to the cleansing flood in the time of Noah. Lord, may this story remind us of the consequences of sin and the importance of living righteous lives in a world that often mirrors the chaos of ancient times. Help us to be a source of your light, spreading peace and righteousness. Father, we seek your guidance on whether we should engage with the book of Enoch. This ancient text offers insights and expands on the narratives found in our Bible. Yet we recognize the need for discernment. We do not wish to be led astray by apocryphal writings, but rather we seek to enhance our understanding of your word and the history of our faith. Grant us the wisdom to discern what is true, what aligns with your teachings, and what is beneficial for our spiritual growth. As we study, let our hearts remain anchored in the canonical scriptures, which are the inspired word of God. May our exploration of the book of Enoch serve to deepen our appreciation for the Bible and enrich our faith. Help us to approach the study with a spirit of humility and a desire to glorify you in all that we learn. Lord, pray for unity among believers as we explore these ancient texts. Differences in interpretation and opinion can lead to division, but 
we ask that you bind us together in love and mutual respect. May our discussions be marked by grace and understanding, always seeking to edify one another and build up the body of Christ. Let us be open to learning and growing together, acknowledging that our ultimate goal is to know you more deeply. We also lift up those who may feel confused or conflicted by the content of the Book of Enoch. Some may question its relevance or be unsure of how to reconcile it with the Bible. Father, we ask that you bring clarity and peace to their hearts. Help them to navigate these questions with faith and trust in you, knowing that you are the author of all truth. As we reflect on the stories of the fallen watchers in the Nephilim, may we also remember the hope and redemption that comes through Jesus Christ. Though the book of Enoch speaks of judgment and corruption, we are reminded of your infinite mercy and grace. Through Christ's sacrifice, we are offered forgiveness and a path to eternal life. Let this be the cornerstone of our faith and the lens through which we view all other teachings. In this journey of exploration, may we remain steadfast in our devotion to you. Let our studies draw us nearer to your heart and deepen our commitment to living out your commandments. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to grow in knowledge and faith. We trust that you will guide us and protect us as we seek to understand the complexities of our spiritual heritage. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.